Achtung! Where are the reserves? There are none! Well, we've committed everything to the skies today. It's the second of our Battle of Britain themes. Actually, they should... Where are the reserves? There are none. No, oh, there's, there's none, mate, because he's from New Zealand. That's right, there's none, mate. Yeah, sucks. Um, we've committed everything to the skies today. It's the second of our Battle of Britain theme special. So many questions last week. Um, and we, you know what, we barely scratched the surface um, with our attempt to answer some of those questions. Um, and um, before we get going on the next tranche um, across La Manche, um, you, you, you had a reply from an expert about bailing out, didn't oh, you? Yeah. Cause we this talked is, this about is, how low yeah. you could bail out. Yeah, so this is my friend Matt Doncaster, who used to fly fast jets. Well, he's a Harriet pilot, actually, for the RAF. Wow. Um, and, and Matt is brilliant. So so he's a guy, he, he comes and gives me sort of lessons on, on how to do aerial combat and how to do bombing and all sorts of stuff. And he comes right. with flip charts and everything. He's super efficient. Um and fascinating it is too. But anyway, he just went, Morning, just listened to the BOB um, podcast and interested to hear the minimum abandonment height question. With an ejection abandonment, seat... Abandonment, that's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> Not barely out, it's abandonment. <laughs> you can tell he used to be a pilot. Yeah. Uh, with an ejection yeah. seat, we used a rule of thumb of one-tenth rate of descent. So 600-foot AGL, whatever that means, if coming down at yep. 6,000 feet minimum. Uh, with only yeah. a parachute, as you rightly said on the podcast, oh, we got that bit right. It um, it depends on attitude and rate of descent. But out of aerobatics, we use three thousand AGL. What do you think AGL means? Right, whatever it does. Um, Angle of ground level. Altitude ground level. Yes, maybe something like that. Anyway, so that's not that's, a bad figure to hang one's that's hat on. Well, because altitude is sea level normally, isn't it? So this is this is feet from the ground, isn't it? Yes. Because that's the crucial bit when you when you're bailing out above ground level. Above, above ground, ground level. level. Of course, wanna... of course, above ground level. Yes. Because <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the thing God. that really matters when you're jumping out of a plane. You can be at three thousand feet sea level over a mountain. And <laughs> above ground level, of course, of course, of course. So, okay, so you are on. listening so... to we have ways of making you talk. Two experts um, in the field. <laughs> <laughs> feeding a subject into their mincer and turning the handle. Anyway, <laughs> so that's pretty trying to work out right, acronyms. Right. Um, so, yeah. um, um, but out of aerobatics, we used three thousand foot above ground level. So that's not a bad figure right. to hang one's hat on. And um, he put. He then adds that three thousand feet was often referred to as if control not regained by 3,000 feet, abandoned the aircraft. So it might take another 1,000 to get out, so quite a buffer. And that's peacetime rules. In combat, it would have been a different story. Fighting right down to the deck, you'd have to trade speed for height, then abandon at whatever height you could gain. Same with ejection seats. Zoom and boom was the phrase, save for the loss of an engine at low level in a single-engine jet, and it didn't relight. So there you go. There's That's that footage, isn't there, of a, of, a, of a bloke ejecting from a Harrier basically on the runway. Yes. Because um, his Harrier flames out and he's, all right, I'll get out then. <laughs> I mean, honestly. I mean, of course, no ejector seats um, in Hurricanes and Spitfires um, or Heinkels or Messerschmitts or Dornies. I mean, if you're on one of the bomber planes, of course, you've got to find your way out of the thing. It's not just a question of getting the canopy off and unstrapping yourself and hurling yourself out. You've got to crawl along a bucketing... Yeah shaking aircraft yeah. to find the hatch to cry, climb out. I mean, you know, and if you've, if any of your listeners have ever been inside a Lancaster, so I've been, we've both been lucky enough that the main spar in the lank between the front compartment and the back, you think, how would I ever get across that in a, in a, with a parachute on, with the thing corkscrewing and on yeah. fire and it's I mean, just, anyway. it's, just, I, I think the bottom line is, is if you're, if you're in a, in a steep descent, your ability to abandon the, uh, abandon the aircraft is going to be limited, isn't it? Slight, ever so slightly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, right. So we're talking about the Battle of Britain. I think um, before <laughs> before we get started, a quick reminder that we're back on Gurglebox this week. Um, Gurglebox, of course, our live stream. Um, we. Of of Band of Brothers, so um so we're live streaming at eight thirty on Thursday as usual. We had a week off last week. Thank you so much. It enabled me to rehearse the little music project I was doing on Thursday night with my daughter Willow on Saturday night, which was a great success and lots of people watched and find it on YouTube. It's brilliant, even though it's me whacking drums at the back. Um, we are live streaming on Thursday evening. Um, and we're on to part three of Band of Brothers. Karen Tan. Karen Tan. Um, then a general live Karen Tan. 
Um, and then a general live stream following on immediately afterwards. Um, so we'll be taking your questions. If you do, don't make any plans for Thursday, except for a takeaway and a few no, chilled it. drinks. Um, I mean, the fact yeah, the fact yeah, that yeah, exactly. it's my son's birthday party and it's going to be 29 degrees outside. Just don't worry about that. <laughs> I'll have been reading. Um, there's this new book about um, one of the phases of the Mediterranean campaign. Um, coming out this autumn, and I will have been reading the audiobook for that um, all day uh, on yes. Thursday. So that might yes. be on my mind, James. It's about um, oh, what's the, um, name, of, what's the name of the place? Sir, 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 Sicily. That's right. Yes, yeah, so, Sicily. I don't know. Um, I don't know how um, full up you are with that book, James. But I will be going going on and on about it. On no, no, no. I'm happy to talk until I'm blue in the face about right. Sicily. I love it. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Right. So, like I say, no plans on Thursday night. Don't make any. 8.30 on Thursday night live streaming for Banner Brothers Part 3, Carrying Town. You know the drill, so you have it lined up on your iPad, on your screen or whatever, and then and then we all, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all start together, and, and we'll watch it and comment and and get, I expect, digress. Um, and we'll be announcing our August book selections next week. Remember that independent company members get a big discount from Waterstones. Hundreds of you took advantage of this month, which was just fantastic to see. In fact, you managed to buy every existing copy of Eagle Day. That's I in told you it was good. I told you it was good. Yeah, but I mean, you know, these these people... They want these books. They do. They want these books they to the do. point where ink has to be... Sp- I mean, think of the squids right now being p- being squeezed so that these people can I'm, read but, the But I'm day. also just... I'm just getting so excited about all the kind of books that we can yeah, offer people. There's so many good ones. And, and I, then I, our I, little... And books uh, are we allowed there, to talk about our little reprint idea? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. But I think that's... But I think that dangle is that dangles plenty. Now, let's move on to your Battle of Britain <laughs> questions. But I think I think the thing we ought to do before we, we get going is I know we have our regular listeners, our independent company members, our Patreon members who are, you know, who who have sort of signed up fully to this uh, cult of the afflicted. But there obviously there'll be people joining us fresh or who are coming at the Battle of Britain fresh because there's some lots of anniversary stuff coming up and who may not on first principles or first grab or have, or know enough know the story the idea of the few or know the the inherited tale which is attack the radar on the airfields first then switch the cities the what and the why but what is i mean i think the question to ask or or, or the thing to lay down is what is the battle of britain first principles what is the darn thing what's it all uh, about uh, what, what i mean i mean uh, arguably what's the point right because <laughs> because you could look at the battle of britain and you see that the luftwaffe and we talked about this last week. They're making up as they go along to start with. They're, they're figuring out what, what, which bit to lean on, where to deliver the, concentrate their force. And they can't make up their minds. And the thing we talked about last week, of course, which is a kind of like post-match analysis thing, is that they never had the strength to be able to do probably not even one of the th- several things they set out to do as the battle progressed. Right. But what are they trying to do? Because after all, if you look at the, if you, if you, if you're the Germans you could think, well, we can't, if you soberly assess their capability, they look at, they look at this and think, well, we can't achieve anything, so let's just not bother. Let's not waste this incredibly precious and important asset, the Luftwaffe, an incredibly important and precious asset that's tangled up, that's tied up in the state, because Goering, who's one of Hitler's many number twos, I mean, he was surrounded by number twos, let's be honest, right? One of Hitler's many number twos, it's, that's his political um, paperweight that keeps him on Hitler's desk, isn't it? it the Luftwaffe right so why is he prepared to waste this asset that they're after all they're already thinking about going to Russia the next year why are they doing this what's the point well, and, and after the, all uh, well, well let me finish because after all the army also don't really think they can pull off sea lion not really the Kriegsmarine know they can't sea lion of course being the project the, the, the sort of not even projected, but the sort of um, uh, 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 imagined invasion of Great Britain. So why, what's going on, James? I mean, you've written a book about this. Can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the, the, the whole, the Wehrmacht, which is the German armed forces, they are, it's basically geared to land battles. And so the, the, yep. the Luftwaffe has grown up from its announcement in 1935 organically as offering close air support, what we would call a tactical air force, there to support yep. ground operations. The Navy is also kind of, they're not really sure about the Navy, but it's basically to support the same thing, i.e. kind of yep. interrupt the enemy's trade and, and, and supply lines so that when they're on the ground, they're not as effective as they might be. So it's all yep. about the land battle. 
Um, what Hitler is assuming, because he views people through the same narrow worldview and prism of his own kind of outlook, is yeah. that with Britain's army defeated and France defeated, obviously Britain will sue for peace. I mean, what other self-respecting country would, you know, what what, what else can it, can it do? Um, yeah. But of course, for Britain, the senior service is the Royal Navy and not the land warfare. And because we're a silent nation, we don't think in terms of continental battle so much. We think much more in terms of sort of global presence, policing, you know, keeping the empire yep. going, all the rest of it. So our whole kind of military way of thinking is completely different to that of Nazi Germany. So for us, there's no reason to go, uh, um, go and sue for peace immediately, despite the kind of immediate kind of... Um, blindsidedness of the strategic earthquake of the fall of France and, and, and the retreat yeah. from Dunkirk. Um, but Hitler is sitting there kind of sort of waiting for us, for Britain, to kind of go, OK, let's talk terms. Because he yeah. he, he can't see that <laughs> the Nazis are repugnant to Britain at all. He just thinks we're all kind of cut from the same cloth. We're all Saxons and Northern yeah. Europeans. And why aren't we all on the same side? Yeah. It seems crazy. Um and of course, you know, Britain has absolutely no intention of that, particularly after Churchill's kind of won that war cabinet meeting, which we all talked about yeah. ad finitum a few weeks ago. Um, so then they've got a massive problem because how do you, you know, the, the, the German armed forces aren't geared up for a cross-channel invasion. And suddenly they can't just march into Britain because there's a whopping great channel in the way. You know, Britain yeah. is an island, so you've got to cross the English channel. So how do you do that? And even Hitler recognises that there can be no consideration of a cross-channel invasion until you've got air superiority over the invasion area. And that means basically southern England, which basically means yeah. destroying the RAF. So destroying the RAF is a prerequisite for a cross-channel invasion. So the yeah. Luftwaffe are hurried up to the, the Channel Coast, in particularly the fighter planes, the ones with the shortest amount of fuel, you know, the smallest amount of fuel yep. um, fuel tanks, they need to get to the Pas de Calais. All around Calais, you suddenly have all these massive fighter airfields which are all being developed. Um, there's some in Normandy as well. Bombers, bomber um, is slightly different. They can take over French um, airfields that have already uh, yeah. been put in place in northern France and in, in the Low Countries. So they're moved up there. But all of this, of course, all takes time. Um, but the moment they start arriving, then they're, they're pushed into trying to goad the, the RAF into the channel so they can yeah. fight over neutral ground. So the distance they're traveling is not so great. Um, yeah. And obviously, if the RAF gets shot down to the channel, then they can't kind of refight again. Meanwhile, Dowding, who is the commander in chief of fighter command, is saying to the RAF, whatever you do, don't don't succumb to this. Don't follow the Luftwaffe out over the sea. Fight over ground as much as you possibly can. So that's what's going on in, in, in July 1940, in preparation for the all-out um, Adler Angriff attack of the Eagles, which is what Goering calls it, which is this attempt to subdue the um, the RAF. And, and in his pre-battle um, plan, Goering reckons it's going to take three days, but just to be on the safe side, he announces four. He reckons he needs three, four days of, of, of half-decent weather with no rain, no yeah. low cloud, and then he'll be able to destroy the RAF. That's the plan. Yeah. Uh, um, Hitler is, in July 1940, is already starting to think about the Soviet Union. And yeah. because if the Battle of Britain doesn't work, if they can't subdue the RAF, if there can't be a cross-channel invasion, then what's plan B? Because the big problem you've got is you haven't defeated the West. And the whole way that the German war plan works is on complete annihilation of your enemy. So there is no half measures. Yeah. You've got to completely yeah. defeat them. And so you can't send the British army packing but still have the Royal Navy and the RAF still running amok. You know, that's, that is yeah. just not acceptable. So how, yeah. do you, how do you get around that? You've got to defeat Britain very, very quickly. And clearly, what is absolutely clear from the summer of 1940 onwards is that America has huge industrial potential and is hovering on the far side of the Atlantic very much in favour of the British uh, and Western democracy rather than Germany. So that's another kind of threat that's kind of hovering in the background. So the idea yeah. that you don't subdue Britain is just is just completely unthinkable. But the big problem that Germany has is because it's sort of caught up in the centre of Europe and resource poor, and because the Navy isn't very big, the Kriegsmarine isn't very big, and because Brit mm. the Royal Navy has already imposed an economic blockade, how is Germany going to get the resources it needs when its trading empire is kind of largely cut off um, and it has no access to the world's oceans or very little access to the and world's oceans? And also factor in that ideologically, um, 
you know, we're talking about Jewish Bolshevism, as it were. All that as well. All, all, all that, and that, and the, you know, and the Lebensraum idea that right. what, what, what you need to do is expand Germany so that you create a German empire yes. and all this sort of thing. So there's, so there's, there's sort of three, there's three rats fighting in the let's attack Russia sack, as it were. You know, the, 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 these three motivating forces. Yeah, what is absolutely clear, the moment Hitler takes power, is that at some point there is going to be the great showdown between Soviet Union yeah. and Nazi Germany. That is yeah. absolutely certain. What isn't certain is when that's going to take place. And so yeah. although you're absolutely right, the Lebensraum idea, the ideological aspect of defeating Bolshevism, of getting rid of the Jewish issue... All that is absolutely part of the 1930s, you know, and even earlier than that, 1920s kind of Nazi mantra yeah. ideology. Yeah. In the summer of 1940, up until Britain starts to show a reluctance to sue for terms, there is no question that they would yeah. do it as early as 1941 because they're not just ready. But yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. speed with which they have defeated France and the Low Countries and the desperation... Of the desperate stakes involved that they've got a massive resource shortfall if they can't subdue Britain encourages Hitler to go well I might have been originally kind of thinking vaguely in terms of kind of 1943 1944 for an invasion yeah. of the Soviet Union but what happens if I kind of fast forward that to 1941 instead yeah and that's yeah. what's starting to take root but, so but but with got, that in mind and you know because I mean I think what's one of the things we we you know, I'm, and I'm always trying to get my head around this, is that you have this sort of um, interesting thing when both sides are misjudging each other right from the start. So that the, the, the Hitler seems to think that he can win decisive battles against his enemies in the Clausewitzian sense, where you win a decisive battle and you go, all right, game's up, which is what happens in France, right? And he thinks he can win a decisive battle against the British, the British don't regard decisive battles the same way as he does, because because they're thinking they're thinking quite differently. Like you said, he's land battle, and they're like global, right? They're thinking, well, we actually we do things globally, and we have for a really long time because we're a global empire. That's that's our thinking. Whereas he's like he's continental Europe. You go, you, and we talked about this before. You go east, you go west, or you go south. That, that, those are your, those are your options, basically. Um, you don't cross oceans. You don't, and in fact, you probably don't think too much about what control of the oceans actually involves on a global scale. So his idea of a decisive battle is one thing, and then the Allies are also thinking in terms of mm -hmm. decisive battles, which is where you end up later in the war, where they have decisively won several times. Stalingrad is a decisive battle. Tunisia, what happens in Tunisia is a decisive battle. What happens in Sicily is a decisive battle. You know, there's all these points at which. If it were the other way round, the Allies would go, all right, we've, we've lost, <laughs> if you see what I mean. But, and, and both sides are permanently misreading each other. And you end up with this, this, constant, this constant sort of uh, uh, problem throughout, or, 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 or moment, moments that reoccur throughout the Second World War, where, where the, the, each side judges the other by its own standards and misses by a mile, if you see what I mean. And the Battle of Britain is a perfect example of that, of that happening. Is, is uh, the Luftwaffe are judging the RAF by their own standards and Goering is judging the UK by his own standards and has no idea actually of what's going on politically, militarily or any of it, does he? I mean, Not the, really. the, 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 the truly striking thing is how little they know <clears> about <throat> what's going on in, in the UK at all. And they're obviously judging their encounters with the RAF by what's happened in France where it's been piecemeal, squadrons fed in bit by bit. There's been no, there is no air defence system in France. There's no vectoring. And you look at how the RAF fights in France if you're the Luftwaffe, and you probably think, well, yeah, we can do that. We can beat them. And, it, uh, you know, we, we, we've done pretty well against those hurricanes so far. Should be all right, really. And yeah, then how hard can it be? How hard can it be? And then when Dunkirk comes, they run into Spitfires. And think, oh, how hard can it be? Well, it's a little bit harder than it was. And then, and then there's a complete change in the paradigm of how the RAF operate operates when the Battle of Britain starts so which so th there's our preamble in case well, you don't yeah know just the last thing I just said on that is, is that you know for, yeah. for, for Germany it's all about the land battle where 
air power and naval power are augmenting what you're doing on the subservient. land. Subservient. Well, they're, where, no, they're subservient. subservient. They're subservient, yeah. Whereas for Britain, the entire way of thinking, the whole entire British way of war, is about naval power, burgeoning air power, and you've got to do the land bit because eventually you've got to take the land. But, but Well, and maybe you pay pay someone else to do the land bit, which is maybe the old you British pay someone way else. Yeah, exactly. But it's just a totally <laughs> different way of thinking yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so your questions. Um, um, Peter Robinson says, was there a realistic chance that Fighter Command could ever end up unable to put any fighters on any particular day, put up any fighters on any particular day? And the answer to that is, is basically no. No. Isn't it? I remember talking to uh, to Billy Drake and to Tom Neal. And Tom had this sort of yeah. wonderful... Uh, not only did he have a very vivid and clear memory of, of the events that he took part in, he'd also thought about it and had analysed his experiences. So yeah. he was a kind of a rare bird in that in that way. Um, and I remember asking him, I was saying, Tom, you know, did you did you ever wake up on any given day and not have a hurricane to, hurricane to fly in? Because he was flying with two four nine squadron, mainly from North Weald, yeah. bottom down, then then yeah. North Weald. And he said. No. Where they came from, how they got there, nobody ever knew. But every morning we had the full complement of squadron. And actually, of course, they were delivered by the ATA. And he was just yeah. brilliant. And I remember asking uh, Billy Drake, I said, did you ever at any point wake up and not have enough planes to fly? And he just looked at me and he went, no. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. I mean, so, so the answer is absolutely not. Um, and at no point was Downing under any pressure. So Downing's strategy was to have these uh, to have squadrons based across the entire country. And there's two reasons for that. One is um, so that you don't have a mass of airfields that the Germans can attack. Attack. You know, if the Germans want to destroy yeah. you on the ground, they've got to go all over the whole flipping country, which makes it yeah. much much harder for them. The second reason, of course, is because the Germans, the Luftwaffe, can, can, can attack from all over. They they can reach any part of the United Kingdom. So you need to yeah. defend it. Um, the third reason, of course, is because actually they've got enough to do what they need to do um, yeah. most of the time. The, the, uh, as we were discussing last week or the week before, whenever it was, the amount of times where the Germans sent over more aircraft than Fighter Command could put up against them was actually, you can literally count on one hand during the Battle yeah. of Britain. So, um, no, is, is the long and short of it. The concern for Fighter Command was not aircraft it was pilots but i think we touched on this the other day didn't we the whole point is is that the reason why dowding and park who was commander of 11 group uh, which was the kind of in the front line down in south uh, southeast england were were so worried was because their front line squadrons those at biggin hill west Malling, uh um you know Tangmere, uh, and so on yeah north Weald, were down to 75 percent pilot strength but your squadron yeah. is based on the idea that you would have 12 airborne. Whereas in actual fact, they had double that number to, to furnish, to service 12 in the air. So you would have, a squadron yeah. would have 22 to 24 pilots to, 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 yeah. to ensure that there was always 12 in the air at any one given time. And so that those pilots weren't being overused and weren't being overexhausted. So when yeah. he's talking yeah, about 75% yeah. strength, what they're talking about is 17 to 18 pilots rather than... 22 to 24 yes. but they've still got a yeah, yeah. buffer of 50 percent over yeah. what they need in the sky at one time so so my the point that i've argued in, in what i've been doing is that actually park and dowding didn't need to be quite so worried as they were but obviously when you're fighting a defensive battle being over cautious and overestimating the strength of your enemy is not a bad thing whereas if you are the aggressor and yeah. you underestimate the strength of the enemy you're attacking again that is a massive error which of course is the error that yeah. the germans commit which is of course the mistake they're, they're making yeah yeah okay um andy stone asks did the spit and hurry pilots have genuine fear of the 109 or believe that it was down to them and their skills in the aircraft oh i think well, the 109, the 109 uh, it, armament alone makes it a difficult opponent because it's heavier. It has heavy, We talked again. We did touch on this last week that the the 109's got <laughs> cannons. So if you're if a 109 does catch up with you and in the receiving end of it, you're in real trouble, uh, relatively speaking, aren't you? Yeah, 
Well, I mean, again, I, I don't want to keep quoting Tom Neal, but I'm going to. Um, uh, I remember talking to Tom at North Weald in the old pilot's hut there and him saying, to me, what you've got to remember is the 109E could do the three things you needed to do in air-to-air combat in 1940. It could climb faster than a Spitfire and Hurricane. It could dive faster yep. than a Spitfire and a Hurricane. And it could pack a bigger punch yep. in the combat zone than a Spitfire and Hurricane. So he said that yeah. made it the best fighter plane in 1940. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the the truth is, is if you talk to a, a whole host of Spitfire and Hurricane pilots, they'll probably all give you a different answer. I mean, I think all of them had a healthy respect for the German fighter pilot. You know, his skills, his training, yeah. the planes they were flying, all yeah. those sort of things. Of course, I mean, you'd be an idiot not to. Um, but did they kind of fear them? I mean, obviously, some people, every time they got in a cockpit, were absolutely cacking themselves. Other people, you know, yeah. sort of went into a zone and, and they were kind of sort of, you know, composed enough that they could they could deal with it. I mean, people deal with fear and, and yeah. all that kind of stuff um, in, in different ways. I think the key, the key point is I don't think that the ME109E was so outstandingly superior that you felt... Wow, you know, we're kind of... There was no, we're, we're, yes, we're, no we're, point getting in my plane today. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't yeah. think so, because it wasn't so outstanding. You know, we're talking about narrow margins here of superiority. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, the 109 has the disadvantages of being only uh, only having having so much fuel so you might be in the midst of in the middle of some sort of encounter with an 109 and the, and he just he has to go home he, yeah he, he doesn't doesn't use his 55 seconds worth of machine gun ammunition yeah because he's got it because he's run out of fuel and he's got to turn turn t- uh, tail and beetle home right um we it's time for us to refuel we'll take a short break and be back in a moment Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Um, we're trying to answer all your Battle of Britain questions, and uh, so far we've answered two. <laughs> I've, I've, well, I've got a point just quickly on the Spitfire and Hurricane and all all right. fear of yeah, one and nine. So, so, so there was a there was a general belief amongst Spitfire and, and, and Hurricane pilots that they could outturn a, a one hundred and nine, and that yeah. uh, you know if if so. so if a 109 is in trouble, all it's got to do is put the stick down and it'll dive out of the way and it'll get away. Yeah. Whereas, um, so Spitfire and Hurricane can't do that, but they could get into a tight circle and they would, you know, unless yeah. they're up against a really, really skilled pilot, they would always be able to outturn it. So eventually yeah. the 109 would have to break off. In actual fact, that wasn't strictly speaking the case because as obviously as you're turning, your speed drops off. Um, yeah. uh, and um, uh, and at a certain point, slats come out of the wings because it's got such a high wing load. So it's got these very, very small wings. Um, so you have to incre- uh, uh, lower the wing loading when you're coming into land to make it more stable. So they have these yeah. slats that come out. So what you can do is you can, uh, as you're coming, as you're turning, if you're a 109 and you're in a turn, you can actually then pull out the slats, um, lower the wing loading, um, and that will make you out turn a Spitfire and a Hurricane. But only yeah. the kind of super duper pilots are going to be able to do that and have that knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, I don't think people were that especially scared of a 109. But obviously, if you, um, you know, if you were up against someone and you were tussling around the sky and you had a really good good pilot on your tail, you were, you know, you were in, you were in big trouble. Yeah. OK, now Louis Hoskin asks, while the RAF <clears> and the <throat> Navy were obviously leading the charge, what were the army getting up to during the battle? Licking their wounds and rebuilding, or did they play a more active role in AA defence, for example? Well, there is anti-aircraft defence, and we, and we, again, we, that's the thing we touched on last week. That basically part of what the anti-aircraft um, defence role was was making people feel like there was an anti-aircraft defence system by firing their guns. They weren't necessarily firing at anything. anything. But, but, but no, the well, the army, the army. So basically, the army is reorganising, sorting itself out. Um, uh, loads of people are being sacked and replaced. Um, uh, is a great big shakedown, top, top down. Loads of people are being sacked and replaced, and they're taking delivery of, of an awful lot of rifles. Um, uh, and there, there's 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 that sort of month, isn't there, between the end of Dunkirk and the and the beginning of the Battle of Britain proper, where the army, where they do only have one. Thompson machine gun in the whole of South East England or whatever that statistic is <laughs> so like, oh, that doesn't sound good and they haven't got any artillery and they haven't got they haven't got anything much really to fight with but there's a big real there's basically a big reorganization going on and a, and a, and as well as the as well as the uh, formation of um, of uh, 
of that what becomes a home guard of course the LDV but there's there's a thing going on where the army's the army is getting its shit together and in fact getting ready to go to North Africa too which is the which is the other thing that sort of is part of this picture that, that, that well yeah of, I mean I mean, what's amazing is the fact that, you know, they're sending out hurricanes in July 1940 to Malta um, and to yep. the Middle East. They're sending out, you know, the 300 tanks they send out, whatever it is, 250 tanks they send out to the Middle East as well. Um, yep. You know, but, but you know, the first thing they do is they, you know, all the all the street signs get taken down, I think, at the very end of end of May, beginning of June, something like that. Yep. Um, yep. Wire on the beaches, mining all the beaches, all the rest of it. Um uh, and yeah, you know the big the big shortfall is is the lack of guns. So I think of the number of divisions there are, you know, I think there's only sort of I think there's sort of single digit divisions are at full strength um, in yep. the summer of 1940. But that's sort of again, you know, that's that that that's it's pretty disastrous. But it's not completely disastrous. Canadians have been there since the end of 1939, so the first Canadian yep. division fully equipped, pretty much. Yep. Um, they're down in Southeast Kent, which is one of the reasons why they're fighting at Juneau in the middle of the British line, because they're already there. So you yep. just go straight across the channel in 1944. Um, and, yeah, you know, there is the Home Guard. There's also the development of the auxiliary units. And the auxiliary units are yep. interesting because, of course, you know, they're the first kind of um, um, uh, sabotage operation, you know, guerrilla operation to be mounted before someone's actually invaded. No one else has yeah. thought of this. So, you know, there's certain things where the Brit- British are quite sort of ahead of the game, really. Um, there's, yeah. a, there's the HQ line, of course, which is this defence of this river yeah. line. So the idea is that you would let them come first and then you'd get behind your, you'd fall back behind your defensive position, which is all along rivers and stuff. I mean, there's a couple of, uh, the whole load of pillboxes in Salisbury, for example, um, yeah. uh, which I sort of go past every time I go up to the station. And, um, uh, and there's all that. And yeah, you know, absolutely, they're getting ready. I mean, everyone coming back from Dunkirk, they're giving a little, you know, it's like short battle leave and then it's straight back to the front. And, you know, the people yeah. manning guns all along the south coast. Um, they're yep. on anti-invasion watch on the coast. Lots and lots of coastal patrols, manning the headlands and all the rest of it, um, uh, and, and training. Loads and loads of training. Uh, and of course, the factories are going into overdrive. It's not just just aircraft factories that are producing l- large amounts of Hurricanes and Spitfires and Whitleys and Hamptons and Blenheims and all the rest of it in Wellingtons. It's also, um, um, you know, it's also, also the ordnance factories producing guns and tanks and, you know, yeah. and getting them as, as as quickly as they possibly can. And of course, lots yeah. of rifles coming yeah. from the United States. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the, the army. So a bit of everything is the, the truth. A bit of everything getting busy. Right. Barry John asks. My question would be, would be what was the furthest north and furthest west that the Battle of Britain was fought? I know Aberdeen refers to the twelfth of July, nineteen forty, as Black Friday due to the number of casualties that day from bombing. We've got you've got um, the Luftwaffe. I mean, if it depends what you classify as the Battle of Britain, don't you? I mean, you've got the Luftwaffe. Ha- looking at scapa flow the entire time for instance mm. so so there's stuff as far north as that but yeah i mean i i i, I, I do you know about the what do you know about the aberdeen raid uh on the uh, on i've the got to say not not very much to be perfectly honest but i mean they are they, they they are doing these these raids and they're going all across you know bombers obviously going across the country there are sort of you know bombing raids in south wales as well i remember 92 squadron get bombed at pembury don't they at one point yeah. um yeah. you know it's not very often um because it's just a little bit too far, and they've got sort of bigger, bigger targets yeah. closer to home. I mean, what always amazes me is sort of how many times Great Yarmouth gets hit and things like this. You kind of, it's not the most obvious one, is it? No, no, no it really isn't, is it? That, that's a that's a very good point. Maybe they just don't like fish fingers, the Germans, right? Um, okay, so, <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, but the furthest west. Where's the furthest? What, what would be the furthest west? The, is Cornwall attacked? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, there's sort of, you know, Junkers 88s coming over. Junkers 88s tend to have a sort of slightly longer range than um, than the Heinkels and, and, and Dornier, yeah. so they were tended to be the kind of really long range stuff. Yeah. Um, and Belfast, and were... Belfast as well was attacked, wasn't it? For, because it's it's shipping, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. Shipbuilding. Yeah, in the Blitz. Yeah, but I don't think in the Battle of Britain. Right, OK. Um, James Gisby, or maybe Gisby, asks, what happened to German captured German pilots? One of my students said they had a German POW work on their farm in West Sussex. Was this a typical experience? Yeah. OK, so um, it depended who you were. So um, if you're an officer, you were taken to Trent Park, uh, yeah. which was uh, um, Philip Sassoon's um, place. He also had Port Limp is now a, um, a kind of a safari park isn't it british safari park um but but trent park was where they went uh, and it's fascinating actually because uh, what they did was they put them up in in sort of comparative luxury but what they do is they yeah. take them out individually interrogate them really hard knowing perfectly well that they wouldn't get anything out of them at all 
and then they'd sort of literally give them sort of cocoa and biscuits and and um and put them in a in soft furnishings and put them in yeah. a room together with with sort of comparative comfort and all the rooms would be bugged and that's the bit that they were really interested in yeah. and they'd all start talking to each other um and anyway the transcripts of these can be read i mean they're all there at, at the national archives and i went through absolutely ton of them when i was doing my battle of britain book and they're so yeah. so interesting i mean and 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 so revealing i mean you know yeah. you, you do see this kind of morale arc quite clearly at the beginning of the battle they you know they think they're absolutely going to smash it um and by kind of late september october there's lots and lots of doubts there's also amusing comments so people sort of go, going what is this googly they talk about and all this kind of stuff it's really funny <laughs> <laughs> um um, but but the but the kind of other rankers, you know, that they, they, yeah, they were just shuffled off into POW camps and there were POW yeah. camps all over the place. Some of them were then shifted off to Canada uh, and North America and you know in the United States for POW camps there. But yeah, loads of them were set off and ended up working on farms. I mean, you know, yeah. and lots of lots of subsequent prisoners. Uh, as, a, as a sort of tangent to this, um, the the Battle of Britain. I mean, I, I heard it described by someone once. When I was I was. Where, where was I? I was at RAF Cosford, and I think I was looking at the Defiant and thinking, well, you know, that would make a great airfix kit, but that's about the limit of it. And um, I, <laughs> I, I, and I got talking to someone, and they were talking about the Battle of Britain like as an as, as an alien invasion. You know, it's the War of the Worlds. It's yeah. it's uh, in, in those terms. If you're a civilian in South East England and you've got this going on, you know, it's. And we talked about this last week as well. This is the first ever battle for air suprem supremacy there's ever been uh, 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 at this sort of range. I mean, it's not a tactical... It, uh, again, we, we talked about the Luftwaffe being a sort of... You know, it's, it's, an, it's a battlefield um, weapon rather than a strategic weapon. But this is the first battle for strategic air superiority there's ever been. You've got, you've got you know, b bombers, o bombers over Kent, crash landing. It's like it is. It's war. It is science fiction, isn't it? For, yeah. for nineteen forty, yeah. it is. It is the sort of thing that's been written about by people like H. G. Wells, Shape of Things to Come. This is. This is the. This is the. The futuristic space battle, Star Wars space battle of nineteen forty, and I, I, I. You know, we talked about. <clears throat> pilots being captured and looked after and all this sort of thing but surely pilots were chased around by crowds with angry crowds with pitchforks surely there are people who, who civilians who who if they found a pilot would 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 kill them and you know you know you know what i mean is that this is at, the, at this distance can we talk about that what the actual say civilian reaction is in somewhere like kent if a bomber lands at the end of that's been trying to kill you and your fellow uh, citizens, a bomber crash. Say a bomber crash lands in the park behind my house here. I might be inclined to go round and 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 you know uh, kill the pilot. Do, 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 do you know what I mean? That's going on too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't. It is. Yeah, and people are attacked with pitchforks. With pitchforks, and people are. There's definitely airmen who are murdered. You know that does yeah. happen, or lynched rather. You know. Yeah. Well, that is murdering, isn't it? Um, yes. Um, yeah. It's um, technicality. But for the most part, it doesn't happen because most British people are kind of rather undemonstrative and aren't kind of violently inclined. I mean, you know, we, we get this impression of that even today with all the kind of, you know, street fighting and fisticuffs and fights and brawls that happen on Saturday nights and all the rest of it. But but most people aren't. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a whole generation of schoolboys who kind of just find the whole thing you know, unspeakably thrilling. And the moment a plane yeah. comes down, they all kind of get on their bikes and kind of hurtle after it. I mean, I remember talking to this guy in the village here. He started work on a farm in 1944, age 14, and was only retired two years ago. And he's absolutely amazing. And he says, says oh, I remember when the 109 came up over on Gurston Down and we all sent off in our bicycles. Um, and, and, and we got there and there was a crash plane and there were bits of the pilot all over the woods. And he says, said, I found a hand. And, and you know... <laughs> God. And I said, oh, you must have felt a bit, bit kind of funny about that, didn't you? Did that, that sort of bring it home to you? And he goes, no, not really, because, you know, he was a German. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's... And that's he's the sweetest guy ever. But, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, I was sort of quite shocked. But, but you know, it's... um. Again, you know, you, it, responses are different depending on who you are, how old you are, what sex you are, all kind of... Yeah, there's yeah. a whole different, different kind of things 
coming into play. I mean, you know, it was a real problem for the for the foreign pilots, wasn't it? Was they come down and they yes. wouldn't be speaking fluent English, and you know, people would kind yeah, of yeah. you know shove pitchforks up the asses of Polish pilots, Pol- Polish you know, pilots as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, but, ju- I, I just, I, I mean, I, I, I wonder how much how much has been written about that though, about about the sort of civilian end that that that. that because it is, you know, we we do with the Battle of Britain. I think necessarily end up focusing on the pilots and the and the and the story yeah. of the air battle in the sky. But it's the story of the people watching it above. Because you know, uh, it, it's the silvery trails and all that sort of romantic language of air battle. And air battle, mm. air battle, after all, does end up in a sort of you know, knights of the air romantic. Kind of, yeah, there's uh, an amazing uh, uh, painting uh, uh, by Paul Nash, isn't there, of the kind yeah. of fight, a fight air battle yeah. over Portland, and it's just amazing, yeah. sort of, all the contrails and stuff. I mean, I yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been reading a lot of this stuff recently, and um, you know, these diaries are, are are fascinating. I mean, you know, people, you know, the, the sort of middle aged diarists, they're sort of going, how ghastly it is, appalling to see these sort of terrible hordes coming over these barbarians. Yeah. But then you kind of, you know, I was reading, there was a fun called, there was a, there was a rather charming book of these sort of sisters up in Norfolk somewhere called, uh, mm. I think it's Norfolk, or is it Lincolnshire, called Waiting for Hitler. And it's, yeah. you know, it's fascinating. For them, the whole thing's just kind of quite exciting, really. You know, yeah. it's the same for the schoolboys. I mean, there's all those amazing, fo- uh, those cartoons by Pont. Do you know the ones I mean? Yeah. Uh, and there's a sort of, you know, um, uh, and as the Nazi invasion um, looks ever more threatening, you, you know, panic grips Britain. And there's a picture of two yeah. blokes sat in a pub, just totally yeah. motionless, guys yeah, are yeah. polishing a glass, looking completely unperturbed. Yeah. And then there's a, my absolute favourite is the old bloke in his deck chair, kind of, you know, with his binoculars pointing skywards, sort of going, oh, I can see a formation of this. And the two, and his wife and his wife's friend just carrying on chatting and talking about tea yeah. and stuff and not the slightest bit interested. Yeah, but those are so a bit... brilliant. But are those not a bit propagandary anyway? Of course like, they you know, are. The, yeah, of course they are. Like carry on style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, of course, but I think they do sort of tap into a, a kind of. I, I think there is this. I think what happens is is there is such shock, such panic in late May nineteen forty. Yeah. yeah. The strategic earthquake. You know, yeah. uh, uh, and there, there is, and even into June and early July, where, you know. This is the kind of the myth of the Nazi war machine, the unstoppable mighty yeah. Moloch that, you know, yeah. we're powerless yeah. to do. We little Britain here with our kind of, you know, our, our kind of chintz curtains and, and patterned yeah. tablecloths. You know, how could we possibly come up against these sort of automatons with their yeah. kind of these stormtroopers and parachutists and, yeah. you know, dive bombers and all the rest of it. But then when it doesn't happen, I think the shift is so quick between, yeah. oh, actually, it's all going to be fine. And, and and I think there is this real <laughs> shift where people start suddenly think, yeah, actually, we can do this. Yeah, uh, and actually, it's, it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and and although there is that slight panic, isn't there, on the seventh? I think it's the same day as the as the um, the Blitz starts, the Saturday, the seventh of, of September, is when there yeah. is that alarm goes off, and it's the Crom. Is it Cromwell? I think it's called. Is yes, the, it's Cromwell. Yeah, yeah. Is, is a is a yeah. sort of anti invasion. Uh, uh, um, preparation order, isn't it? And yeah. people sort of get all the home guard get terribly carried away, and start sort of you know um, doing roadblocks left, right, and centre, and prodding people up the arse that come down from the sky. Yeah. Um, but I think there is that you do see this really, really quick shift, and I think you know what what you get is the shock of the new, isn't it? It's the shock of, yeah. of of this sort of total kind of everything that you thought you knew being thrown into into kind of disarray and that's sort of slightly been the case with covid hasn't it you know to start yep. off with lockdown everyone was just like oh my god what what on earth is going on and then it, that sort of replaced by kind of sort of weary kind of weary and weary resignation yeah and, and then everyone just starts getting a bit fed up with it and, yep. and 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 i think that was the same in 1940 yes, albeit, if anything it, if anything, there's our there's your parallel. I mean, you know, because right at the start of this crisis, everyone and we we were entirely red-handed guilty of this. How does this compare to the Second World War? Um, is Churchill is yeah. John Boris Johnson who insists on comparing himself to Churchill Churchill, or is he Chamberlain? You know, and 
uh, and actually maybe the other way of looking at it is is how you know how do populations deal with massive change and crisis they end up by the end of it we go oh fucking hell we have to deal with this enough, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also but i remember at the beginning of it you know you you read all those the other the other i think really kind of valid comparison is you had all those sort of ap- ap- apocalyptic kind of reports in the newspaper and on the news are sort of you know you know expect 60 percent of 80 yeah. percent of the population to get it and you know yeah. two hundred and fifty thousand people dead you know yeah. and and i remember thinking Crikey, this is actually is a little bit scary. You know, I've been feeling a yep. bit apprehensive about it, and now I'm kind of oh, really. Have I really got to do hand sanitizer after every six overs in a cricket match? What's the point of that? You know, and I'm kind of you know, and I feel I feel very mixed about wearing a mask. I mean, I just can't I mean, how, bear how, how, it. Brit- how how British is that? Is it might affect the cricket old boy? I mean, honestly, there you are. Like, you know, this is sort of you're you're the, the, you I, are the guy in the I, deck chair I, with the binoculars. <laughs> yeah, I rest my case. <laughs> but but I suppose the the difference of 1940 is that you do have this. I mean, I mean, how many times have you heard sort of you know people on documentaries they sort of go, oh yeah, I remember I was you know I was standing at, down at Hastings, Hastings and I looked up and the whole sky was black with swastikas, and yeah. and you know it wasn't. You know, you t- <laughs> because you couldn't see a swastika from that height. You know, they're yeah, going to be yeah. coming over at sort of fifteen thousand feet. Yeah. You can't see that. What you can see is little black dots, uh, and and you know, the sky but wasn't black it's, with them. It, it was the about no- hundred it- aircraft. But I think that that we go, we're right back at the sci-fi novelty of it all. I, I think yeah. I would. I think if I would, if I saw a bomber fleet for the for the first time ever in human history in the sky, I'd exaggerate about it. You know, yeah, of course you would. Of course you would. Not and, about, and it would seem horrific. It's how it, because it's about how you feel about it rather than about the event in itself, which, after all, is one of the exactly. perils of the perils of witnessing, you know, relying on eyewitness history testament. Is this the, but that's a, my point. That yeah, is my point. Yeah, yeah. OK, um, we're, we've, got, we've got time for one more question. I've got a bunch in front of me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this one from Andy Watson, which says, Cadet Sergeant Moses Sipos of 114 Gosforth ATC asks, that's rather good, how much... <laughs> Were the pilots on both sides paid, and did it vary by aircraft type? No, I think it, officers got slightly more than sergeant pilots. Yeah, and sergeant pilots got more than leading aircraftsmen. Yeah, um, they all flew that. They all flew the same types, though. There's no they all flew I mean, the same the, types. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Luftwaffe didn't get paid particularly well. Um, and the RF didn't get paid particularly well. It wasn't until the Americans got into the war that people started getting paid. Started, well, yeah, it. well, it, well, it wasn't until the Americans got into the war people started worrying about their pay. At, you know, or, because the moment you've got someone being paid more than you to compare it to, you start worrying about your pay. I mean, it, it, I mean, I've got, I've got, also, I've got, I've got the list of how much they were paid somewhere, but I just haven't got it to my fingertips. But you know, it's literally sort of, you know, twenty. It was it twenty-five shillings a day or something. I mean, it's literally yeah. nothing. Yeah. I mean, it's not at this stage in the war. It's not about the pay, is it? It's um, it's about you know, it's about this fight to the death in the skies over England. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and 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 sometimes Scotland, and sometimes Northern Ireland, and sometimes Wales. You know, and you, and you get you get post. fed, you get fed, <laughs> yeah. You yeah, get put up, yeah. board and lodging. Yeah. I mean, you're paying for beer mainly if you're in fighter command, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And you know, you you know, depending on who you were and where you were, you might get a few freebies thrown in. Um, and of course, you've got the unique opportunity of being able to fly a Spitfire or Hurricane. You know. <laughs> but the Mark you. One Spitfire, though, James. I mean, honestly, oh well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, well, inevitably, what's happened is we've kind of used our time up, and we've only answered four questions, five questions. So we will. I think we're going to have to do. I, I see no harm in returning to this subject next week with more of your questions. Remember that we've got Google Box back on uh, Thursday, eight thirty. Karen Tan episode three, which we're going to roll into. The, roll into our. Um, I mean, normal. I say normal live cast. There's nothing normal about the live class. Um, uh, you need your own copy <laughs> lined up on the last bit of the opening titles with all the lads stood on the ridge. And on Thursday, what we'll do is we'll explain exactly what that timing comes to on your. On, it was two minutes twenty. Minutes twenty three last time. Yeah, but it was on the last episode. But they're all they're all slightly different because sometimes you have the old boys talking before the credits, and sometimes you have a, a little bit of pre sig adventure, and sometimes you just have yep. the signature tune. So we will by Thursday we will have a definitive time for you for the Patreon members, of course, um, regular podcast listeners. Join the Patreon and find out exactly what you're missing. <laughs> <laughs> Anarchic fun. Anarchic fun. Um, so, we haven't won the Battle of Britain, but you don't need to win the Battle of Britain after all. You just need to make sure you don't lose it. That's the exactly. thing. Um, exactly. Uh, 
Uh, if you see German podcasts clambering up the beaches of southern England this week, you'll know we didn't do enough. We'll be back with more um, Battle of Britain next week, I expect. Uh, but we'll see you all in the meantime on Thursday. I hope for the live stream. Toodle pip. Cheerio.